what does AI mean for my job? Yeah. Is, is it going to mean that I don't have a job or my kids are not going to have a job? I think we are seeing the most disruptive force in history here. We will have the first time something that is smarter than the smartest human. There will come a point where no job is needed. You can have a job if you want to have a job for personal satisfaction, but the AI will be able to do everything. We won't have universal basic income, we'll have universal high income. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Elon, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, we, feel, we feel very privileged. We're excited to have you. Right, so I'm going to start with some questions and then we're going to open it up. Let me get Great. straight into it. So, Bill Gates said, there is no one in our time who has done more to push the bounds of science innovation than you. Well, that's kind of him to say. Yeah, well, that's it. That's a nice thing to have anyone say about you. Nice coming from Bill Gates. But oddly enough, when it comes to AI, actually, for around a decade, you've almost been doing the opposite and saying, hang on, yeah. we need to think about what we're doing and what we're pushing here and what do we do to make this safe and, and actually yeah. maybe we shouldn't be pushing as fast or as hard as we are. Like, I mean, you've been doing it for a decade. Like, what was it that caused you to think about it that way and you know, why do we need to be worried? Yeah, I've been somewhat of a Cassandra for quite a while um, where, pe where people would, uh, I would tell people, like, we should really be concerned about AI. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, they've never really had any experience with, with AI. Uh, but it, since I was immersed in um, technology, I have been immersed in, in technology for a long time, I could see it coming. Um, so, uh, but I think this year was, th there have been a number of, of breakthroughs. I mean, you know, the point at which someone can see a dynamically created video of themselves, um, you know, like somebody can make a video of you saying anything in real time, um, or me. Um, and. Uh, so there's sort of the, the deep fake videos, which are really incredibly good. In fact, sometimes more convincing than real ones. Um, and <laughs> deep real. Um, and um, and then and then obviously things like ChatGPT were were quite remarkable. Now I saw uh, GPT one, GPT two, GPT three, GPT four. The, the, you know the whole sort of lead up to that. So it was easy for me to um, kind of see where it's going. If you just sort of extrapolate the points on a curve and assume that trend will continue, then we will have um, profound artificial intelligence and obviously at a level that far exceeds uh, human intelligence. Um, so, um, but I, I'm glad to see at this point that uh, people are taking uh, safety seriously and I'd, I'd uh, like to say th thank you for holding this uh, AI safety conference. I think actually it will go down in history as being very important. I think it's, it's really qu quite profound. Um, and. Um, and, and I do think overall that the potential is there for a, artificial intelligence, AI, to um, have most likely a positive effect um, and to create a future of abundance where there is no scarcity of goods and services. Uh, but but it, it is somewhat the, of the, the magic genie problem, where if you have a magic genie that can grant all the wishes, um, usually those stories um, don't end well. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, including wishes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you talked a little bit about the, the summit, and thank you for being engaged in it, which has been great, and people enjoyed having you there, participating in this dialogue. Now, one of the things that we achieved today in the meetings between the companies and uh, the leaders was a, an agreement that externally, ideally governments, should be doing safety testing of models before they're released. Yeah. I think this is something that you've spoken about a little bit. It was something we worked really hard on yeah. because you know, my job in government is to say, hang on, there is a potential risk here, not a, right. not a definite risk, but a potential risk yeah. of something that could be bad. Yeah. You know, my job is to protect the country. Yes. That, and we can only do that if we develop the capability we need in our safety institute and then go in and make sure we can test the models before they are released. Delighted that that happened today, but you know, what, what's your view on what we should be doing? Right? You've talked about yeah. the potential risk. Right? Again, we don't know, but you know, what are the types of things governments like ours should be doing to manage and mitigate against those risks? Well, I generally think that, that it is good for government to play a role when the public safety is, is at risk. So um, you know, for, really, for the vast majority of software, um, the public safety is not at risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if the, if the uh, app crashes on your phone or your laptop, it's not a, a massive catastrophe. Um, but when you're talking about digital superintelligence, I think which, which does pose a, a risk to the public, then there, there is a role for government to play to safeguard the interests of the public. And, and this is, of course, true in, in many fields, um, you know, aviation, cars, 
uh, you know, I, I, and I deal with regulators uh, throughout the world uh, because of um, Starlink being communications, rockets being aerospace, and cars, you know, being, being tra vehicle transport. So I'm very familiar with dealing with, with regulators. Um, and I actually agree with the vast majority of regulations. There's a few that I disagree with from time to time, but 0.1% probably, of, or le less than 1% of regulations I disagree with. So, um, and there is some concern from uh, people in Silicon Valley who have never dealt with regulators before, and they think that this is going to just crush innovation and, and slow them down and be annoying. But, <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, it will be annoying, it's true. Um, <laughs> they're not wrong about that. Um, but. But, but I think there's, we've learned over the years that uh, having a referee is a good thing. And if you look at any sports game, there's always a, a referee. And, and nobody's suggesting, I think, to have a sports game without one. Um, and, and I think that's the, the right way to think about this, is for, um, for government to be a, a referee to make sure the sportsmanlike conduct and, and, and that the public safety is, um, you know, it, it, is, is addressed, that we care about the public safety. Because I, I think there might be, at times, too much optimism about technology. And I, speak, I say that as a technologist. I mean, so I ought to know. Um, and, and, uh, and, and like I said, on, on balance, I think that, that the AI will be a, a force for good, most likely. But the probability of it going bad is not 0%. Yeah. So we, we just need to mitigate the downside potential. And then how... You talk about referee, and that's what we're trying to do. Demis right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> there we go. I mean, you know, and we talked about this, and Demis and I discussed this a long time ago. I'm like uh, literally facing right at him. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you know, Demis, to his credit, and the credit of people in the industry, did say that to us. Yeah. I think, you know, Demis said it's not right yeah. that Demis and his colleagues are marking their own homework, right? There needs right. to be someone independent, and that's why we've developed the Safety Institute here. I mean, do you think governments can develop the expertise? One of the things we need to do is say, hang on, you know, Demis, Sam, all the others have got a lot of very smart people doing this. Governments need to quickly tool up capability-wise, personnel-wise, yeah. which is what we're doing. I mean, do you think it is possible for governments to do that fast enough, given how quickly the technology is developing? Or what do we need to do to make sure we do do it quick enough? No, I think it's, 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 good, it's a great point you're making. Um, the, the pace of, of, of AI is faster than any technology I've seen in history by far. Um, and it's it seems to be growing in capability by at, at least fivefold, perhaps tenfold per year. It, it'll certainly grow by an order of magnitude next year. Yeah. So, um, so and, and, and government isn't used to moving at that speed. Um, but, I, but I think even if there are not um, firm regulations, um, even if there's not, even if there isn't an enforcement capability, simply having insight and being able to highlight concerns to the public will be very powerful. Um, so, it, even if that's all that's accomplished, I think that will be that's very, still, very good. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully we can do better than that. Hopefully, but, yeah. Yeah. But, no, but that, that's helpful. Actually, and we were talking before. It, it was striking. You know, you're someone who spent their life in technology, yeah. uh, living Moore's Law. And what was interesting over the last couple of days, talking to everyone who's doing the development of this, uh, and I think you'd concur with this, is, is just the pace of advancement here is unlike anything yeah. all of you have seen in your careers in technology. Is that fair? Because you've got yes. these kind of compounding effects from the hardware and, and the data and the personnel. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the, the, the two, um, currently the two leading centers for AI development are the San Francisco Bay Area and the, and the sort of London area. The, um, and there, there are many other places where it's being done, but those are the two leading areas. So I think if, um, you know, if, if if the United States and the UK um, and, and China are um, sort of aligned on, on safety, that's all going to be a, a good thing. Because that's really, that's where, that's, that's where the, the leadership is generally. I mean, you actually, it's interesting, you mentioned China there. So I, yeah. I took a decision to invite China to the summit over the last Very couple good. of days. And it was not an easy decision. A lot of people criticized me for it. Uh, you know, my view is if you're going to try it's and serious conversation, you need to. But I, uh, what would your thoughts? You do business all around the world. You just talked about it there. Yeah. You know, should we be engaging with them? Can we trust them? Is that the right thing to have done? If, if, we don't, if, if China is not on board with uh, AI safety, it, it's somewhat of a moot situation. Uh, the single biggest objection that I get to any kind of AI regulation or, or sort of safety controls um, are, well, China's not going to do it, and therefore they will just jump into the lead and exceed us all. Uh, but 
but actually China is willing to participate in, a, uh, in AI safety. Um, and thank you for inviting them. And, I, and they, uh, you know, I think, I think we should thank China for, for attending. Um, when, I was, when I was in China earlier this year, the, my main subject of discussion with this, this, the leadership in China was AI safety and saying that this, this is really something that they, they should care about. And um, they took it seriously, and, and, I'm, and, um, and you are too, which is, which is great. Um, and having them here, I think, was essential, really. If they're, if they're, if they're not participants, it's, it's uh, pointless. It's pointless, yeah. No, that, and I think we were pleased. I think they were engaged yesterday in the yeah. discussions and actually ended up signing the same communique that everyone else did. That's great. Which is a good start, right? And yeah. as I said, if we need everyone to approach us in a similar way if we're going to have... I think a realistic chance of, of resolving it. I was going to. T- you, you talked about innovation earlier and, and regulation being annoying. There was a good debate today we had about open source, and I think you you've kind of been a proponent of algorithmic transparency yeah. and making some of the the X algorithms public. And I think, yeah, actually we were talking about uh, Jeffrey Hinton on the way in. Yeah. You know, he he's particularly he's been very concerned about open source models being used by bad actors. You've got a group of people who say they are critical to innovation happening in that distributed way. Look, it's, it's a trick. There's probably no perfect answer, and there's a tricky balance. I, what are your thoughts on how we should approach this open source question, or you know, where should we be targeting whatever regulatory or monitoring that we're going to do? Well, the open source um, algorithms and data tend to lag the closed source by six to 12 months. Um, but so, that, so that, but given the rate of improvement, that there's actually therefore quite a big difference between the, cl- the closed source and the and the open. Um, if things are improving by a factor of let's say five mm-hmm. uh, or more, um, then being a year behind is you're five times worse. So it's, it's a pretty big difference, and that might be actually an okay situation. Um, but it, it certainly will we'll get to the point where you've got open source um, AI that can do. That, that will start to approach human level intelligence or perhaps succeed it. Um, I don't know quite what to do about it. I, I think it's somewhat inevitable, inevitable that there'll be some amount of open source, and I, I, I guess I would have a slight bias towards open source, because uh, at least you can see what's going on. Whereas closed source, you don't know what's going on. Now, it should be said with AI that even if it's open source, do you actually know what's going on? Because right. if you've got a gigantic data file and, um, you know, sort of Billions of, da- of, of data points or weights and parameters. Uh, you can't just read it and see what it's going to do. Uh, it's a gigantic file of inscrutable numbers. Um, you can test it when you when you run it. You can test it. You can run a bunch of tests to see what it's going to do. But it, it's probabilistic as opposed to um, deterministic. It's not. It's not like traditional programming where you've got a, a yeah. sur- You've got very discrete logic, and, and, and the outcome is very predictable, and you can read each line and see what each line's going to do. Um, uh, a, a neural net is a, a, just a whole bunch of probabilities. Um, I mean, it, it sort of ends up being a giant comma-separated value file. It's like, our digital god is a CSV file? Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but but that, that is kind of what it is. Yeah. No, it's, it's, that, that point you've just made is one that we have been talking about a lot because, again, conversations with the people who are developing the technology make the point that you've just made. It, it is not like normal software where there's predictability about inputs improving leading to this particular output improving. Yeah. And as the models iterate and improve, we don't quite know what's going to come out the other end. I think Demis would agree with that, which is why I think there is this uh, bias for, look, we need to get in there while the training runs are being done, before the models are released, to understand what is this new iteration brought about yeah. in terms of capability, which it, it sounds like you would, uh, would agree with. I, I was going to shift gears a little bit. On, you know, you've talked a lot about human consciousness, human agency, which actually might strike people as, as strange, given that you are known for being such a brilliant innovator and technologist, but it's, it's quite heartfelt when I hear you talk about it and the importance of maintaining that agency in technology uh, and preserving human consciousness. Yeah. Now, it kind of links to the thing I was going to ask is, when I do interviews or talk to people out and about in this job about AI, the thing that comes up most, actually, is it probably not so much the stuff we've been talking about, but jobs. It's, right. what does AI mean for my job? Yeah. Is it going to mean that I don't have a job or my kids are not going to have a job? Now, 
you know, my, my answer as a, you know, as a policymaker, as a leader is, you know, actually AI is already creating jobs and you can see that in the companies that are starting. Also, the way it's being used is a little bit more as a co-pilot necessarily versus replacing the person. There's still human agency, but it's helping you do your job better, yeah. uh, which is a good thing. And, and as we've seen with technological revolutions in the past, Clearly, there's change in the labor market, yeah. the amount of jobs. I was quoting an MIT study today that they did a couple of years ago. Something like 60% of the jobs at that moment didn't exist 40 years ago, so sure. hard to predict. And my job is to create an incredible education system, whether it's at school, whether it's retraining people yeah. at any point in their career, because ultimately, if we've got a skilled population, they'll yeah. be able to keep up with the, the pace of change and have a good life. But you know, that, it's still a concern. And you know, you, what would your kind of observation be on, on AI and the impact on labor markets and people's jobs and how they should feel about that as they, as they think about this? Well, I think we are seeing the most disruptive force in history here. Um, you know, where we have for the first time, we will have for the first time something that is smarter than the smartest human. Um, and that, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what that moment is, but, but there will come a point where no job is needed. You can have a job if you want to have a job for sort of personal satisfaction, but the AI will be able to do everything. So, I don't know if that makes people comfortable or uncomfortable. It, it, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, that's why, that's why I say if you, if, you, if you wish for a magic genie <laughs> that gives you any wishes you want, and there's no limit. You don't have those three limits, three wish limit nonsense. Uh, you just have many, <laughs> as many wishes as you want. Um, so uh, it, it, it's both good and bad. Um, one of the challenges in the future will be how do we find meaning in life if, if you have a magic genie that can do everything you want. When there's new technology, it tends to have, usually follow an S-curve. In this mm-hmm. case, we're going to be on the exponential portion of the S-curve for a long time. Um, and you'll be, able to, like, so you'll be able to ask for anything. It, it, it won't be a, and we won't have universal basic income. We'll have universal high income. So in some, in some sense, it'll be somewhat of a leveler um, or an equalizer, you know, because really, I think everyone will have access to this magic genie, um, and you'll be able to ask any question. It'll be, certainly be good for education. You could, it'll be the best tutor you could, and, and the most patient tutor, uh, <laughs> so they're all there. Um, and uh, but there will be no shortage of goods and services. We'll be an age of abundance. Um, I think if... I'd recommend people read uh, Ian Banks. The, the Banks culture books are probably the best envisioning. In fact, not probably. They're definitely by far the best envisioning of an AI future. Um, there's nothing even close. So I'd recommend, really recommend Banks. I'm, I'm a very big fan. Um, all his books are good. Um, there's not say which one. All of them. <laughs> um, so, so that's that. That'll give you a sense of what is a. I, I guess a fairly utopian or protopian um, future with with AI, yeah. um, which is good from a as, as you said, it's a universal high income, which is a nice phrase, and that's it's good from yeah. a kind of materialistic sense, age yes. of abundance. Actually, that it kind of then leads to the question that you pose, right? I, I'm someone who believes you know work gives you meaning. Right? I <clears> talk right. a lot about that as as leader. I think work is a good thing. It you know gives people purpose in their lives and. If you then remove a large chunk of that, you know what does that mean, and where do you get that? Yeah. You know where do you get that drive, that motivation, that purpose? I mean, you were talking about it. You, you work a lot of hours. And, I do. You know, it, no, I, it, as, as I was mentioning when we, t- we were talking earlier, I have to somewhat engage in deliberate suspension of disbelief uh, <laughs> because I'm, I'm putting so much blood, sweat, and tears into a work project and burning the you know 3 a.m. oil. Um, then um, I'm like, wait, why am I doing this? I can just wait for the AI to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just lashing myself for no reason. Yeah. Um, it must be a glutton for punishment or something. Um, so, we call, so, Dem- so I, call, call Demis and tell him to hurry up, and then you can have a holiday, right? That's the plan. Yeah, no, it's a, look, it's a, tricky, it's a tricky thing because I think you know, part of our job is to make sure that we can navigate to that very, I think, largely positive place that you're describing it is, it is, I think, and help, positive, help people yeah. through it between now and then because these things bring a lot about change in, in the labor market, as we've seen. Yeah, um, I, I think it probably is generally a good thing because, you know, there, there are a lot of jobs that are uh, uncomfortable or dangerous or yeah, which, sort of tedious, um, and 
the computer will have no problem doing that. Be happy to do that all day long. So, um, you know, it's it's fun to cook food, but it's not that fun to wash the dishes. And like, but the computer is perfectly happy to wash the dishes. Um, and I, I guess there is, um, you know, we still have uh, sports like where, where where humans compete in like the Olympics, and obviously um, a machine can can go faster than any human. But we still have uh, we still humans race against each other, um, and. Uh, and have all you know have these sports competitions against each other, where even though the machines are better, they're still I guess competing to see who can be the best human at something. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and people we'll do find that. fulfillment in that. Yeah. So I guess that's perhaps a, a good example yeah. of how even when machines are faster than us, stronger than us, we still find a way. We still we still enjoy yeah. competing against other humans yeah. to at least see who's the best human. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good that's a good analogy. And we've been talking a lot about managing the risks. I, I just. Before we move on and finish on AI, is to talk a little bit about the opportunities. You know, you're engaged in lots of different companies. Neuralink yeah, being an obvious many. one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> which is doing which is doing some exciting stuff. I, you touched on the thing that I'm probably most excited about, which is in education. Yeah, and I think many people will have seen Sal Khan's uh, video from earlier this year, his TED talk about as you talked about. It's like a personal tutor. Yeah, personal tutor, child. an amazing personal tutor, an amazing personal tutor, and yeah. we know the difference in learning. Having that personalized yeah. tutor is incredible compared to classroom learning. Yeah. So if you can have every child have a personal tutor specifically for them that then just evolves with them over time, yes. that could be extraordinary. And so that, you know, for me, I look at that and I think, gosh, that is within reach at this point. And, yeah. and that's one of the benefits I'm most excited about. Like when you look at the, the landscape of things that you see as possible, what is it that you, know, you are yeah, particularly I, excited about? I, I think certainly AI, AI tutors are going to be amazing. Um, Perhaps already are. Uh, I think there's also perhaps companionship, which may seem odd because how can the computer really be your friend? But if you if you have an AI that has memory, you know, and remembers all of your interactions and has read every, you're gonna say like give it permission to read everything you've ever done. So it really will know you better than anyone, perhaps even yourself. Um, and 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 where you can talk to it every day and and those conversations build upon each other, you will actually have a great friend. Um, as long as that friend can stay your friend and not get turned off or something. <laughs> uh, don't turn off my friend. <laughs> um, but I think that will actually be a real thing. Um, oh. And um, I have a, I have, one of my sons is, is, is sort of has some learning disabilities and, and has trouble making friends, actually. And, and I was like, well, you know, he, an AI friend would actually be great for him. Oh, okay. You know, it's, uh, that was a surprising answer, but that's actually it's worth... Uh, worth reflecting on. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. I mean, we're already seeing it actually as we deliver, you know, psychotherapy anyway. Now doing far more yeah. by digitally and, and by telephone to people, and it's making a huge difference. And you can see a world in which actually, you know, AI can provide that uh, social benefit to people. Um, just a quick question on on X, and then we should open it up to everybody. You made a change when you in one of the well, made many changes but yeah, quite one, a few. one of the changes <laughs> which you know kind of you know goes into the space that you know we have to operate in and this this balance between free speech yeah. and moderation is um, you know we grapple with as politicians sure. you, you were grappling with your inversion of that and and you you moved away from a kind of manual human yeah uh, way of doing it, the moderation to the, the community notes. And, yeah. and I think that's, you know, it was an interesting change, right? It's not what everyone yeah. else has done. It would be good, you know, what's, what was the reasoning behind that and why do you think that is a better way to do that? Um, yeah, part of the problem is if, if, you, if you empower people as censors, then well, ha- there's going to be some amount of bias uh, they have um, and then whoever appoints the censors is effectively in control of information. So then the, the idea behind community notes is, well, how do we have a consensus-driven... Uh, I mean, so it's not really censoring it, but consensus-driven approach to truth. Uh, how, do we, or how, do we, how do we make things um, the least amount untrue? Like you can say, like, what, you can't pass, perhaps get to pure truth, but you can aspire to be more truthful. Um, so the, the, the thing about community notes is it doesn't actually delete anything, it simply adds context. Now that context could be, this thing is untrue for the following reasons. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, but, it, but importantly with community notes, um, everything is open source, actually. So you, you can see ex- the, the software, um, every line of the software, you can see all of the data that went into a community note, and you, and you can independently create that community note. 
So if you've got, if, if you see manipulation of the data, you can actually highlight that and say, well, this, 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 this there appears to be some gaming of the system, um, and you can suggest improvements. Um, so it's, it's, it's maximum transparency. Right, so combined with a kind of wisdom of the crowds and transparency yeah. to get to a better answer. Is it? And, and, and really one of the key elements of community notes is that in order for a note to be shown, people who have historically disagreed must agree. Um, okay. and, and there is a bit of AI usage here. So there's we'll populate a parameter space um, around uh, each contributor to community notes and then a parameter space. So, so everyone's got basically these these vectors associated with them, which so it's it's, it's not as simple as, as right or left. It's saying it, it's it's more it's several hundred vectors that that because things are more complicated than simply right, right or left. And and then we'll we'll do sort of uh, uh, inverse correlation. Say like okay, th- these the, these people generally disagree, but they agree about this note. Okay, so then that and so then that 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 gives the note credibility. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that's, the, that's the core of it, yeah, and it's working quite well. Yeah. Um, okay. I've yet to see a note actually be, be present for more than a few hours uh, that, that is incorrect. So the batting average is extremely good. And, and when I ask people, say, oh, they're worried about community notes sort of being disinformational, like send me one, and then they can't. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, think it's, I think it's quite good. I mean, the general aspiration is with, with the X platform is to inform and entertain the public, um, and to be as accurate as possible and as truthful as possible, um, even if someone doesn't like the truth. You know, it's, it's not, people don't always like the truth. Um, no. <laughs> it's yeah. Not always. Um, yeah. But, but that's, yeah. that's, that's the aspiration. Yeah. And I think if, if, we are, if we stay true to the truth, then I think we'll find that people uh, use, use the system to learn what is going on and to, to learn. They, it, 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 I think actually truth pays. Um, so I think it'll be what, what, I mean, assuming you don't want to engage in self-delusion, then, um, then I think it's, it's the smart move. It's been a huge privilege and pleasure to have you here. Well, thank, you, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Visit our site, EnglishSpeechChannel.com, for exclusive access to video transcripts, offline audio, English lessons, and private classes. Don't forget to explore our free and new ebooks. Also, subscribe to our weekly newsletter for the latest updates. Links in the description below. Thanks for your support.